In this video, I'll show you how to use the Westwind User Security Manager and hook it up to an existing web connection application. Specifically, we're going to create a brand new project and then hook the User Security Manager to it. But before we do that, let's take a look and see what actually gets installed when you install uh, the User Security Manager from your download. The Web Connection User Security Manager installs as a Web Connection project. So I've installed it here into a Web Connection Projects folder and the User Security Manager subfolder. And as you can see, it is actually a standalone application that you can run and execute. So there's a standard deploy folder with all the binary files for the application. So these are your Foxport start folders like the user security manager main, and then the user security manager specific files like the process class, overridden apps user security, and a data file that holds some initial user data that you can use for samples. And then there is also the web folder that contains all the HTML resources as well as templates for the user manager. So there is uh, the recover password template, uh, the login widget, the profile page, and as well as the admin template pages. There's also a custom login view that is used to customize the login page, which is quite different than the stock login page that comes with Web Connection. So this is a standalone Web Connection application. So if you wanted to, you could just run this application and actually check it out. Now we're not actually going to do that. We're going to create a brand new project and then add the user security manager to that project. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm gonna bring up my web connection installation and I'm going to run do console. And I'm going to create a new project. Now it tells me here that I'm not running as an administrator. And in this case, I'm gonna say, okay, because I will not use IIS to run this application, but I'll use IIS Express for this. So I'm gonna create a new project and call it security test and secure process for the process class. And I'm going to use IIS Express. So I can use any of these web servers here, but I'm gonna use IIS Express because that way I have a local installation that I don't need to configure. Okay, and I press next. And then I'm gonna create an extension called ST for security test, and I'm going to let it rip. So this is going to create a brand new project for me. Start it up. And if all was well, I should be able to hit this new project. And sure enough, it is working. It's just a standard web connection project. So the hello scripting world. So there's a script page that's executing. Both of these are working. Okay, so this is a standalone project. It has nothing to do with user security just yet. Okay, so I'm gonna close this all down for a second here. Let's just shut this down. And let's go back to the user security manager. So I'm back to my uh, installation here of the user security manager. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna start this up via the shortcut. Now, if you installed into web connection projects, user security manager, this shortcut should just work. But just to be sure, uh, make sure that you're launching out of the deploy folder and that via web.config or the setpaths.prg uh, sample uh, startup file, you can do set path and make sure that the web connection folders are part of your installation and your path. Okay, so with the environment set, I can now do do question mark. And what I'm going to look for is the user security manager add to project PRG file. And I'm just going to run that. Okay, so it's gonna ask me for two, well, three things actually. Uh, the first thing is it's gonna ask me for a web connection main program file. So I just created this new project. So we're going to go into that project, the security test project, and I'm going to go into the deploy folder and I'm going to pick security test main, which is my mainline program for the application. And then it asks me for a web connection process file. So I'm going to pick the secure process and a file extension that was used for the main project. So I chose ST and I'm going to use that same value here. And it's done. That's all there's to it. It's copied the files over to the other application. So with that, we can quit here and move over back to the security test project. So I'm going to start up the security test project. So the first thing I wanna do is just make sure we're in the right place and let's make sure we're in security test deploy and that set path points at my web connection classes, and it does. So my environment is all ready to go. 
Okay, so I now should be able to launch my new application. So it's going to use IS Express again. And if you look closely, you might notice that this page looks a little bit different. It has a sign in button on it. And you also notice that this default page actually hit my web connection server. So as I hit this, every time it hits this default.st page. So when add to project was run, it was actually converting my default.htm page into a dynamic page that has the sign in button attached to it. So that's something that you want to keep in mind when you're using the user security class. In order for sign-in information to display, it needs to be a dynamic page that is generated on the server in order to be able to display the sign-in information properly on a page. So in this case, I can now log in. So I can say test at test.com with a test password, and I can remember me on this device and log in. And sure enough, I'm logged in now. Okay, so the login logic is part of this request and I can go then to my profile and see my profile information. Not a lot of information available here and that's not because I'm not showing it, but it's simply that, that there's really no data to show here. So this data is actually coming out of the user security table. So this customized version out of the app user security table. And if we edit this table, you can see there's really not much information here that you would want to display to your user. Now this table is meant to be customized for your own user environment. So if you want to capture a company name or you want to capture notes that the user can keep or additional information of any sort that you want to add, you can add it to this table and it will actually be available for templates to render. But by default, it's just displaying the information that is actually available and being used. So this is pretty much the stock information. So if I go back here and I look at my account and I got to make sure I start this back up as launch none. And uh, if I go ahead and sign back out, you also notice that this example application has not been hooked up with security. So if I go to the hello world page, I can still get into that. And I can also get into the hello scripting world. The reason for that is, is that although the user security manager has been hooked up, the security itself has not been enabled yet. So let's go ahead and do that. So the first thing we can do is we can bring up the process class. So modicom secure process, and we can go in here and there's two bits of code in here that you can use to enable security for a particular page or the entire application. So the first thing is a generated block that goes into on process init, and that basically enables security for the entire application. Hold that thought. We'll come back for that in just a minute. The other thing that you can do is you can go in and enable security for individual requests. So I can go in here into this test page, which is this request over here, and I can add this little bit of code to authenticate just this page by basically asking, check to see if the user is authenticated and if not returning false from this page request. And if you return false here, that will cause the login page to be popped up. So let's try this. Let's go back to launch. And if I go to the hello world page now, it brings up my uh, login dialog. So I can go test at test.com, put in the password and sign in. And now I get access to the, the test page here. So now I'm authenticated against this page. And again, if I go in here again, it will work the second time because I'm still logged in. The hello scripting work also works, but then again, that page wasn't locked down. So if I sign out again, and I go to the hello scripting world because we didn't put the authenticate request on there. We should just be able to get to that hello script world. But if we go back to the home page, here we'll get the login dialog because we protected that page individually. Okay, if I go back to the secure process and I take this out again, we can now change the application to authenticate every page. So the sample here kind of puts this block of code in here so that you can easily switch between authentication and non-authentication. So if I set this value to two, it will fall through into the second block of code that runs here. And what this basically says is that an on process in it, it will uh, try to authenticate every single request with the exception of any one of them that is listed in this list right here. So by default, I have it set to ignore the default page, which is the landing page of the application. So you need to be aware of that. So any page that you need to be open in order to be openly accessible, you need to be sure that you add it to this list here. Okay, so once I have this enabled now, 
ignoring the default page, but basically forcing every other page to authenticate that is dynamic. I can launch again. And if I go back to the home page here, we're not logged in right now. If I go to the hello test page, it will prompt me to log in. Also, if I go to the hello scripting page now, it will also force me to log in. So if I go back in here, say test.com test, sign in, we can see that it's now working. Okay, so now both pages can navigate to that user. So let's assume for a second here that I need to log in with an account that I don't have a password for. So I'm going to log in with my username and password, but I do not remember what my password actually is. So I'm going to click on, I forgot my password. It's going to remember my username and my, my email address in this case. I'm going to say recover password. Now what this does is it sends an email to the email server that is configured and to the email address of that user. So rstraw at westwind.com. Now I have a local uh, SMTP server running here on this machine that basically acts as a dead drop. And so it can intercept any of the messages that are being sent out through this account. So it basically sent a, a recovery email. So I can click on this link in here. So it's a recover password link. And if I click on that, it will open that in the browser. So I'm gonna shut that down. And you can see here that it's asking me to enter my password. So basically what it did is it sent an email to me and verified that I am at that email address. And by going to this link, which has a unique ID and validating that link with the email address that I sent originally, it knows that uh, this is a valid account. And so now I can reset my password. So I'm gonna put in a new password. So I'm gonna use, okay. <laughs> Okay, so that's my password now. So I can log in with that account now. So when I get back here, it says my password has been changed. So then I have to log in with that password. And if I do, there I am. So there is my actual user account. And since that's actually a real email address that has a Gravatar account associated with it, I also get my account picture here. So if I go look at my list here, you notice now that this is a little bit different. My user account is actually set up as an admin account. So the admin field is set to true and that allows me access to some additional features here. So if I go to the user admin, I can actually look at all the users that are in the system at this point. So if I wanna search for myself, I can just type a partial name or I can say GE. And so I can drill into this and then bring up my account and make changes to this account. So if I wanna set my access level to nine, I can do that and save the user and that's that. So the next thing we can do is, is actually create a new user account, add a new account, and there's also user validation built into this. So let's create Frank Phony here and Phony 12, Phony, okay. And we're gonna go ahead and create that account. Okay, so you notice here there's a message that pops up and it says an email confirmation has been sent to you to validate the email address. Please click the link in the email to validate your email address. So if I bring up my local server here, you see there is an account validation that was sent to me here. If I go to the body and I have to click on the link, which takes us to the website and now it says your account is validated. So until this happens, you can't log in to the account. It's basically not active until you validate the email address. And this can be turned off via options that are available in the configuration. And so now I should be able to go phony at westwind.com. Hopefully I remembered that password, right? And I should be able to log in, sure. So there's my account, right? Everything works the way that you would expect, Frank Phony. And if we go back to home, Sure enough, if we go to the scripting page, it comes up. If I sign out and sign in, um, again, phony at westwind.com, everything works exactly the same as it did before with my other test account. So perfect. So the last thing I'd like to show is how you can customize the user's security manager by adding some additional information into the user table and then displaying that information through the user interface by modifying the templates. So to do that, let's take a look at the user profile page. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, there isn't a whole lot of information available here, but you can certainly add additional information to this. So what if we wanted to add a company, for example, to this user profile? How would we do that? Well, let's go over into the web connection bit over here in FoxPro and let's add a field to the app user security table. So I'm gonna use that table exclusively and then modi struct. Uh, to add a field to the table. So I'm gonna add a company field here and I'm gonna make that a varchar 
and we're gonna make it 80 characters long and save it. Yes, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna relaunch. And if I reload this page here, the profile page, you'll see no change. So I, even though I've added a new field, it's not automatically reflected in the profile. And the reason for that is quite simple. The profile is a template and the template page has not uh, updated itself to show that information. So we have to manually add that. So when we first start out editing in a new application, then one of the first things I like to do is enable um, live reload. So I'm gonna go to the server administration here, uh, the web connection handlers page or the module administration page. And I wanna make sure that live reload is en enabled. So I can toggle this here on and off. But another thing that we need to do here in this live reload bit is we need to make sure that the .usm extension that is used for the templates is actually included in the live reload extensions list. And it's not there. You see the ST extension, which is the secure test application extension, but not the USM extension. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back into Foxpro onto the status page, click the edit button, which opens Visual Studio Code in the application folder. So, um, so it's in the security test project folder and I can dig into the web folder and go into the web.config file. So if we scroll down a little bit, we see live reload enabled right here and it's true because I said it so. And then uh, if I add the .usm extension here, I can now just save that and close that file out. Okay, if we go back to the browser here and we reload, reread the configuration, we can now see that live reload is enabled and the USM extension is operating just as well. Okay, so live reload is enabled, which means that if we uh, run this application, we should be able to see the changes in real time. So I'm gonna go back into Visual Studio Code here. And what we're going to do is we're going to go into the user manager folder and pull up the profile.usm page. So this is the page that's responsible for this page over here on the left. So we have a user uh, name field or a full name that we're displaying here and a username field, which is actually the email address. So here's the full name field and here's the username field. So what I'm going to do is simply copy this and paste it in here. So if I just save that and do nothing else, immediately we see a duplicate field pop up. So now we have two fields that are exactly identical but we'll wanna change this to use the company information instead. So if I go over here, I'm going to replace this with company. So I'll replace the full name with company. I'm gonna copy that and paste that in, choose a company here. So if we save again, you now see an empty field show up here and that empty field has that placeholder that we just created. So I'm gonna just pick Westwind Technologies as my company and I'm going to save that account. And voila, we've just added the UI for that application. So if I go in here into the user administration, I now should be able to look for my username, click on my record, and here too, I don't see the information. How come? Same reason. We need to actually update the user manager information here. So we need to go to the admin folder here, find the user info, template, which contains this information. And then inside of here, we'll again, copy and paste. And if we save, we should see the username and we can go through here and paste in and copy that and paste that. If I save that now, there's my Westwind Technologies value. Pretty cool, right? So we've updated two templates and both of them are displaying the value. So I'm gonna change this value so we can see it actually change. So this is being written to the database at this point. So if I go back to my user profile now and I look at my account, you can see that it's actually displaying that new value. Cool, right? So one more thing I wanna show here that's related to that. And I'm going to sign out of my account and I'm going to go back to the sign-in form. Now the sign-in form is a little bit special. It's not a USM extension uh, because it is actually a template that's a view template. So this page here, the login.usm page, replaces the original login form that comes with web connection, which is a template in the views folder. So if we go back over here and we look at login.wcs, this is the page that is actually being rendered right here. So there's no login.usm. Login.usm actually defers to this template because it gets internally embedded. So if you wanna make a change to this template, you make it right here. So it says application login here. And if we look up here, we can change that maybe to sign in. And if I change, 
Just as before, as soon as I save the file to disk, Live Reload automatically refreshes it and I can see the change here. So now you can make changes to the underlying database and then also display that information in the user interface quite easily. You can also access that information inside of your secure process class. So if I go to secure process here and we go to the hello world page, I can say user company is this o user dot company. Okay, so that's the user record and the company field that I'm displaying here. Okay, if I run this again now and we go back over here, go to the home page, go to this page, and I'm going to log in as rstrall and sign in. So now it shows me here my user company as Westwind Technologies 2. And what that means is that you can also access this in your code now. So this gives you the flexibility to build additional functionality into the user security manager, and you can extend what the user security manager actually exposes. All right, so this completes this uh, walkthrough, and I hope uh, you found this useful, and thank you for watching.